So the diastolic clock pressure moment characters of patients is claimed to decrease, uh, decrease over a period, 60 day period, after you start dosing the patient with a spiral drug. And the BP measurement is the average of 10 randomly selected individuals, perhaps out of 50 people. It has to be random because if you went on with the same individual, their lifestyle choices might skew the results. So 10 people chosen at random. In practice, we won't do the average. There is a specific design that people follow, but for the sake of this example, I just average. Um, so day, of course, we are not going in sequence because from a practical standpoint, I can't measure a person every day. Um, so day one, five, 15, all the way up to day 55. That is the diastolic pressure. Start with 105, which is pretty high. And that's stage two, all the way down to 76. Um, now, it seems like it is going down, but just because things look like they are going down doesn't make it statistically true or statistically significant. That would be the correct word to use. That said, what would the null hypothesis be? Oh, what would it good to sell up here? Zero. Why not the call? Didn't get the chip. Oh, I, oh, oh, wow. All right. <laughs> I did get the joke now. <laughs> so, rho equals zero. Against the alternative, rho is less than zero because um, claiming, or the claim is that the diastolic pressure decreases um, with the dose or with time. So, negative correlation is what we are testing for. So the alternative is less than zero, which would make this a left tail test. We have an alpha of 0.05. If it is not specified in the problem, we'll just assume 0.05. Um, that said, we have to find the test statistic that statistic is on. One minus six times the sum of di squared divided by n times n plus one times n minus one. Here n is six. What is di? Si minus ri. Si minus ri. Well, what is si? What is ri? What of what color? The rank of each observation. Now, do we combine the two variables together to assign the ranks? No. No. So we assign the ranks for the X variable and the Y variable separately. Does it matter if this is, oh, look, Siri. <laughs> Does it matter it should be this way? <laughs> no, it could be the other way around. But why say why square? Because we're squaring. Okay, let's find the test statistic. So we start assigning the ranks.
It doesn't matter here because it goes in order. So one, two, three, four, five, six. There, it does matter. So the smallest value, so one, um, two, three, four, five, six. We can call these SIs, those RI. The difference is simply SI minus RI. One minus six, negative five. Two minus four, negative two. Three minus five, negative two. Four minus two, negative two. Five minus three, negative two. Six minus one. Bad time. So, two to five. I mean, not that it matters, right? Because we're going to end up squaring, but still. Bad Good. Um, so back over here, one minus six times negative five squared is just five squared plus two squared plus two squared plus two squared plus two squared plus five squared. Divided by n is six. Six times six plus one, seven. Six minus one, five. Those two will go away. So one minus that take and 16. So 76, or oh, is it 66 over 35? And what do we get? Do you want how many decimal places do you want? Four? No. 1.88 five seven. Wait, wait. Oh, no. oh, for, oh, I'm not, sorry, I did the just your, so yeah, negative right. 0.8857. So I'm not in the face because it can't exceed one or a column that go below negative one. Good. So we still can't stop here because we want to determine the significance of what we observed. But before we get to that, what is rho hat? Rho hat is simply the estimate for rho. What is rho hat? The value that I just computed is the estimate for rho. In case you forget, I am testing for rho and I'm getting value R. That R measures the strength of correlation. In this case, it is negative 0.8857. So rho hat is negative 0.8857. What's the point of that? Well, this is in terms of denotation, right? In practice, we will not use the letter R because the letter R is used for um, a co linear correlation coefficient in parametric statistics. But Spearman's rho, it's rho hat, not R. So the intermediate calculation, your book uses R, but by all means, I could have called this rho hat. Yes. So, are we done yet? No. no. We have to do a large 
I got to get the critical value before I get that part. So zero is right in the middle. So where is the rejection which should it be on the left or right? Oh, to the left. Reason being rho is less than zero. You have to keep in mind if you miss this step up, you'll get a negative uh, test statistic, a critical value on the left hand side, but you'd end up saying, I'm not rejecting the norm. So the definition is the crucial step in hypothesis test, of course. I should say the most crucial step. The rejection region is on the left hand side. I have to use an error um, probability that in this case is 0.05. My question to you is should you divide that 0.05? Why not? because it is not to 10. You divide alpha only if it is a two ten test. So in this case, the area that we use is alpha without dividing by two. So the table that we have summarizes the upper critical values for experiment random correlation coefficient. In other words, the one tailed alpha. So, should I pick column two or column three? Two, because the upper area is 0.05, and that would imply that lower one is also 0.05. And is six. So the critical value is 0.829. But should I simply put 0.829 here? No. They have to put negative 0.829. This is perfectly fine because the null distribution is symmetric about zero. The critical value is negative 0.829. On the left hand side, the test statistic is negative 0.8857. Did the test statistic fall in the rejection region? Yes. That would simply mean we should not, excuse me, we should um, reject the null. What would that mean, practically speaking? That claim is true and that row is less than zero. Okay, so there is enough evidence to support. Supposed to claim that rho is less than zero. If you are looking at this data, would you have some faith in this drug in terms of reducing blood pressure, diastolic pressure? Chris says no. Why not, Chris? Um, so, if I look at this, I would say, well, the drug shows promise, but would I do a couple more tests? Absolutely. I would like to have consistent results, and not only that, I did take the average of 10 people, a randomly selected 10 people, but it's best to have, you know, more observations. 
Um, and then if the results are consistent, then sure, we try to expect based on what we see. Um, there is enough evidence, um, even though we have or we need a larger sample, the purpose of small sample tests is to alleviate uh, the difficulties one might have in getting a large sample. Clinical trials, for instance, you can't be testing drugs on 1,000 volunteers, not feasible. Um, you know, if you, you're lucky if you get 70 of them, right? So in such cases, we have a small sample, we have to design the experiment with a small sample. Good. Assuming a large sample approximation holds true. That's a big if. First off, I don't need a large sample approximation to come to a conclusion. I already did that. The purpose of doing the large sample approximation is for you, for practice. That is all. And I'm making an assumption that large sample approximation holds true. In this case, what is the distribution? Large sample distribution. Is it F, chi squared, or normal? Standard normal. Standard normal. Why is that done? Textbook says so. Textbook says so. Why? Something approaches infinity, it approaches the normal distribution. Why can't it not approach a chi squared? Because the test book says so. Yeah. <laughs> now I'm asking you, why can't it not be chi squared? Why normal? Now, Gunner's explanation is, oh, if the sample size gets large enough, it will approach standard normal, exacting center of the theorem and all that. But not necessarily though, uh, for that to hold true, um, you need a sufficiently large sample. And of course, if it is a chi squared, um, we will run into issues um, because chi squared is a right skew distribution. There is my hint. Oh, it's symmetrical. Huh? It's symmetrical. It's symmetrical. Have left side and right side. So normal is the correct distribution to use. So the standardized test statistic is simply R minus mu divided by sigma. R is simply the test statistic we found, negative 0.8857. What is mu? Zero. Zero, the center. The variance for the statistic is? I know we're in minus one. Why is that gonna? Does the textbook say so? Yeah. That's what you gave us, Marta. <laughs> I mean, in this case, I look great because the derivation is quite involved. So we have one over six minus one, which would be 20. So the standardized test statistic is simply R minus zero is simply the R over 0.2. What do we get? Negative two point. Two. 
Yeah, negative 1.98. 1.98? You have 1.97. Okay, maybe set 1.97. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to That's the area I'm going to use. What is the area? The area here is 0 0.05. How do I find that number? The left critical value, what do I use the calculator? Inverse norm. Inverse norm. And the area below is 0.05. So the critical value will be negative 1.645. And the test statistic, standardized test statistic is negative 1.97. One more test. So if you do increase, then it's negative 1.968. 968, okay. So, I got 98. I got 98. Negative 1.9. Well, why would you throw you one of Rounding, rounding, oh. because it's rounding. Um, let's not have a war here. Well, it's rounding. So, if you round that square root of 0.2 prior to putting or prior to dividing, the answer is going to be slightly off, which is why I say that. Say rounding until the very last step, up to until you get to the last step, use four decimals or five decimals. Um, negative 1.98, which is right here. Now, Chris's argument will come into play clearly in this case because if I use an alpha of 0.05. The critical value is negative 1.645. If I used an alpha of 0.025, 2.5% false positive, you put it in the calculator, the critical value is negative 1.96. Very close to negative 1.98. You may say, well, it's still less than one point, negative 1.96. Yeah. But you guys had this conflict because of rounding, yes? Mm -hmm. So this is still a borderline case. Not, you know, even though we've established significance, we need more um, analysis or follow up. So the conclusion is the same. We reject the null, um, which would mean we have enough evidence to support the claim. How do we find the p-value? Is that all? Uh, yeah. If For a left tail one. test, yeah, you do the with the negative test statistic first, and then negative e nine or negative e ninety nine, or you do negative e ninety nine first, right? Yeah. So the only time you do the absolute value of the test statistic and multiply by two is when you do a two tail test. For a left tail test, the p-value is area below the test statistic. For a right tail test, it is the area above the test statistic. Since the distribution is normal, we have normal CDF, negative E99, negative 1.98, zero is the mean, one is the standard deviation, and what do we get? I got point zero two three eight. Come again. Point zero two three eight. Point zero two three eight. So initially, when I started, I said the probability of a type one error, in other words, a false positive. I wanted it to be five percent or less. 
it is less than 5%, I get 0.0238. And I set alpha as 0 0.025, very, very close to make the conclusion of protecting the null. Good. Um, before we end, here is a question, because I'm going to pick up this example and use Theo. Um, because field statistic and correlation are related to each other. So if we do the test, would beta be less than zero or not? So field tests would be slope of the regression model, simple linear regression. Would the conclusion of field test be beta less than zero or beta equal to zero? Less than zero. We will see if that is true next time. <laughs>